How is everybody? Good? Kind of a happy Valentine's Day, a little early, but happy Valentine's Day to you all. Everyone good? Hi, Donald. How are you, sir? Super stinking fantastic? Huh? Dead tired, huh? Well, I pray that God's word would rejuvenate you now. All right? Anyone, th- anyone want that for themselves and for Donald? I do. I do. I, uh, I got to study God's word this week, and it, and it refreshed me, and now I get the, 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 uh, the privilege of standing up here and sharing it with you. So further refreshed, and somehow, I don't even know how this whole thing works, but God has set it up like that, that faith comes from hearing the word of God, and, and, and so this is the deal. Like you have, you're, you're the recipient. You get to hear it, and I get to speak it, and that's a privilege, it's a privilege. And somehow in this crazy preaching, our faith increases. Like, I don't even understand how that works, but it, but it does. So that's cool. So we started this message series last week called A Healthy Body, and we're going to study uh, the church uh, together. And I, and I had shared with you that 2016, I th- believe, was a year where, where God wanted our church here to really come together and become very healthy inwardly so that we could go out and, and reach uh, people for the glory of God. And so that's the task of the church is to, is to reach more people, more people know and love Jesus. That's the goal. That's why we're here. But before we can go out there, we got to get healthy here. And so this message series is all about that, the, that we're going we're gonna to get healthy here so we can go out there. And, and so so we, we took a step back from, from the church as a whole, and we kind of talked last week to kick things off uh, in a singular way, like we're going to talk about ourselves uh, personally first, because if you're going to be, if we're going to have a healthy body, you have to have healthy individual parts, and so we talked about that last week, and we talked about this beautiful relationship that we have with the Lord and, and two things we kind of covered last week to avoid this drift, if you will. If you remember me talking about the drift, how if I get TV, I end up in my recliner on Sunday just brain dead watching football and golf all day and I neglect all the important things in my life. That's my drift and all of us have a drift. We all admitted it. We all raised our hands when I asked you if you have a drift, and you said yes. And to avoid the drift, there's really two things. There's a partnership going on, and, and first and foremost, it's, it's the good Lord. He is, he is working in you. He gave us this promise of the Holy Spirit, and we got saved, converted, uh, regenerated, uh, uh, We're a new birth in Christ, whatever you want to call it. When you became a new creation, it's when this Holy Spirit came inside of you and you were new and this spirit that began a good work would continue to work on you. So he's doing some things in you. And we talked about how this Holy Spirit, when he gives us faith, that that he also takes that faith and it leads to moral excellence. And then that moral excellence leads to godliness and then the godliness leads to, to patient endurance and then patient endurance leads to to loving other believers, then ultimately it leads to loving all people. So you see the work of God's Spirit inside of the believer. And then there's this relationship that I talked about, though. And that relationship was God's doing this in you, but there's something that you have to do, too. And the one thing that we talked about last week, and I want to reiterate again, is the one thing that we as a believer have to do so that this stuff that God's promising to do, there's one thing we have to do to ensure sure that he's going to do this and that is to make sure we put ourselves into an environment to receive faith that's what we have to do it's not a work it's not a religion of works it's just putting ourselves into an environment where God's word can be proclaimed over you so that's kind of what I'm going to do here on a Saturday night I'm going to do that tonight and it's also, it could be when you curl up on your chair with your own Bible and you read God's word and it speaks to you through your voice. It can also mean that you put on YouTube and watch a good preacher or teacher. It could be about reading a good quality book that gives fresh perspective on the scriptures by a well-respected man or a woman of God who can explain scripture to you. Perhaps it's in prayer When not just, you know, Jesus said that we we live on every word that comes out of the Father's mouth, right? So these these are God's words, but also when we pray and he kind of speaks to you in the Spirit, those are his words too. And so in all those situations, those are the environments you want to put yourself in so that God can pour faith into you and that faith 
will create some things inside of you. And so what Paul said, the only thing that we have to do because we're, we're lazy and we're busy and we got all these distractions, he says, I discipline my body. Remember that? I discipline my body like an athlete. And in the NIV, he says, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave. Like, I, I'm busy, I'm lazy, I don't want to do this stuff, I don't want to put myself in a position to gain faith, but I'm going to make myself do it because I know that that's what God wants. And I know if I want this great change in my life, I've got to put myself into that situation where God can build my faith. So that brings us to this week, and we're going to transition from the me you know, an individual faith-building situation to a group setting. So although the message last week was extreme, extremely personal, it still is now because the Bible's written to you and you alone. Do you understand what I mean by that? The other, when Mark's Bible, guess, who's, guess who Mark's Bible's written to? It's written to Mark. And Frank's Bible's written to Frank. Right? And Drew, your Bible's written to you. We're all, the, God's Word's written to you, singular. But within God's Word, it talks about this group, and that's us. So even though it's very personal, uh, the, there's no provision in the Christian faith for a Lone Ranger. You know, as a matter of fact, I was thinking about this Lone Ranger thing. Do you know Lone Ranger wasn't even a Lone Ranger? He had a buddy, didn't he? Tonto. The Lone Ranger wasn't even alone. It was false advertising. See, see, no Christian is to be alone, okay? So I got some verses. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna feed you these verses and I want you to chew on them and let them speak to you. But watch how Paul transitions from the, from the me to the we. And the first one is in Romans 12, four. If you have a Bible, please open it up. And if you don't have one, there's plenty of these blue ones here on the chairs. Please, please lay your eyes onto God's word. Um, that's the ultimate authority of truth. And, and I want to make sure that what I tell you is coming from the scriptures, and that's the only way you're going to know. So Romans 12:4, this is, this is what it says. Let me see if I've got the right thing. Yeah. It says, "Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function." So I'm going to stop there for a second. We all understand that, right? Paul uses an awesome example. It's something we can all understand. We all know that we're, we're a, 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 co a collection, our personal bodies, which we talked about last week, was just ourself. We're a collection of parts. You know what I mean? Like, I, I would, it would be hard for me to, to effectively conduct myself as a human being if I was missing some parts. If I didn't have a heart or if I didn't have a liver or if I didn't have an arm, if I didn't have eyes or a nose or, I mean, it would, I wouldn't be able to function as well as I could if I'm whole. We all understand this pretty easy concept to get. And so Paul uses this concept to, to tell you, listen, we all get this. We're, we're one body with many parts, but we need all of them. And so here's the transition from me to we. He says, uh, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. So just as our bodies individually need hands and feet and legs and liver and spleen and heart and brain. We need all these things to function properly. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. So just as the body needs all of our parts to be effective, the body of Christ needs all of its parts to be effective. That's a great amen spot. Thank you. Okay, here's some more verses. I want you to just kind of jot these down. I'll share them with you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we have, been, we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. I love this one. All of you, who is that? How many? Every, every one of us, right? All of you together. I, I love that word. All of you together. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, I hear people say it all the time. Well, I've been called out of the church. Wait, I don't even understand what that means, you know. Well, I love Jesus, but I just can't stand the church. Listen, they're, they're interchangeable, right? Th this is why. You can't love Jesus and not love his body. It's like going up to, to Scotty and saying, you know what, I love your head, but I don't like the rest of you. The, remember, just as a body has many parts, right? Listen, just as a body has many parts, his head and his shoulder make up his body. 
He's not just a head, right? He has, he has arms and legs and feet and hands and eyes. and He's all those parts. You can't love one part and not love the whole thing. So you can't say, well, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. They're interchangeable. They're the same. We are Christ's body here on earth. So you can't say you love Jesus and not love the church. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.12, and Ephesians 5.23 all say the same thing. And it says the church is Christ's body. If, I'll get with you afterwards. Ephesians 5.30, all Christians are members of his body. And I want to stress that for a moment because many of you know we don't have membership in this church. And people have questioned, why don't you have membership in the church? Because it seems like all churches have members. Why don't you have members? Well, years ago when this church first started, I had read this and it says that all Christians are members of his body. Now I'm reading that I'm thinking, okay, if, 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 if I'm a believer and I'm a member of the church, what, what, what more do I need than that? Right? What other membership card do I need to have to make me real? Do I need to be a, a member of Revolution Church? Listen, if you are, if you are a, a, a Bible-believing Christ follower, right, you're a member of Revolution Church if you've never even stepped foot in this place. All right? And, you're, and if, you're a, if, if any other church out there is a Bible-believing, Christ-loving church, then guess what? You are a member of their church, every single one of them. We are a member of Christ's body, and I just kind of doubt that we need anything like greater than that. I don't even think that that's possible. So th that's why there's really no membership here. Uh, Colossians 1.18 says that Christ is the head of his body, which is the church. Okay, So he's the head, and guess what? We are the body. So if you could visualize Jesus, if you will, his body from like his neck, from his bottom jaw down, if you will, that's us. We are Jesus. You know, it says in the scriptures that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. We all get that, right? Well, guess what? You're the visible image of the invisible Jesus. That you are his body. You are his, his actual body, flesh and blood, here on this earth. And people will know him by the way they know you. That's kind of scary, okay? So... Um, let me see. My, my notes are a total disaster this week, so you're going to have to bear with me. I don't even know where I am. Um, where am I? Oh, yeah. So there's a, there's a pattern through all these, these verses, and it's this, that we're one. We are one. Just as Jesus prayed to his Father, he's prayed that we would all be one as Jesus the Son and God the Father are one. So perfect unity one, he wants us to be the same exact way. And I want you to really ponder that thought. Let it, let it sink in and, and reflect upon how you view and interact and serve and love the body of Christ that you're in. Jesus Christ said that he wants us to be one as the Father and he are one. And, and I shared a little bit with the band earlier in prayer that this week has been a little bit difficult because I've had some interaction with some of the people in our church and there's some friction between people. And it, and it, breaks, it breaks my heart to see it, but it certainly breaks the Lord's heart. And I think that we have to really take a moment to let this really sink in. I think that would be beneficial for us all to be thinking about how we really are to interact with one another. You know, the scriptures, I, I, I don't... I think it was Jessica, and, and when we were praying, she mentioned that, that the world will know who we really are by the way we love one another. And so when you, when, you, when, you, when you have Christian brothers and sisters at odds and they're fighting and squabbling, and that's, that's, that's not what God wants for you. He wants us to, to love one another. And so sometimes it's going to be painful and hard, but we have to step into what he wants and trust that the one who, who lifts the sun every morning and then lowers it in the evening, that he is right. And when we do what it says in Scripture, good things will actually come of it, even though it initially may hurt. We are one. Colossians 3.11, it says this. It says, in this new life. You know, this new life. Uh, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, Right? 
And so if anyone in, in this new life, if you're a new creation, he says, in this new life, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbaric and uncivilized, slave or free. That's all that matters is Christ is in all of us. And so what he's doing back then, see, nowadays there's not a whole lot of like barbarians and stuff like that, and I really don't know or care if you've been circumcised or not. We don't need evidence of that case. But, but the thing is, is that what Paul's saying here is that he's saying, he's listing the things back then that divided people. And so, and so we have to just take this now and go, okay, well, in, in our modern context, what, how does society d- define us? How does it divide us? See, because the church, in the scriptures, it says the church, let there be no division among you. Like, no division. So, so how do we divide here? How does the culture that we're immersed in as a church, how does that culture divide us? It divides us uh, man and woman, young and old, black and white, north and south, Democrat, Republican, uh, you know, all of that. Okay, denominations within the church. Denomination's another word for what? division. We're different. We're separated. And so, you know, we're, we're being separated by the culture that we're in. And what Paul is saying here is that when Christ went to the cross, he reconciled all the people. That it didn't matter if you were rich or poor, like your socioeconomic status. It didn't matter if you were rich or you were poor. It didn't matter if you were born on this side of the tracks or on this side of the tracks. It didn't make any difference. If you're a brother in Christ, we're the same. We're all one family. You read in the book of Philemon, you'll see that there's that Paul, this great apostle, the leader of the church, right? He's buddies with this slave. And he writes the slave owner, he says, Listen, I want you to treat your your slave as a brother. I want you to treat him just like if I was coming to your house. And so what, what Christ has done is he's taken all of us and all the things that our society wants to separate and divide us with. Christ says those things don't matter anymore. As a matter of fact, don't, don't, don't shun those things. Rejoice that you are different, but in your differences come together. So it's not division anymore. Now it's what? It's diversity. And that's beautiful. That's what he wants. Okay. Um, Ephesians 2, 14 and 16, here's two verses I want to just add to your list. If you read those two verses, you're going to see that, again, Paul says that, that Christ, through his death and resurrection, that he reconciled Jews and Gentiles, all the different people, he reconciled them together, and then he took that group of people and he reconciled that whole group, all of us, no matter what color, no matter how poor or rich, where we live, didn't make any difference. He took all those people and he reconciled them to God. So here's Jesus' prayer, right? His prayer is that they would all be one as you and I are one. And on the cross, he accomplished that already. And now it's just up to us to live that thing out in obedience to his word. He said he already did it. Amen. So here's the most, but here's the most important verse, that I, and I want to share this with you, and then we'll move on. The most important verse to this whole thing is in Ephesians 4, verses 15 and 16. If you would do me a favor and go there. I, wanna, I want you to read it. I don't want you to just take my word on this thing. Because this is, this is huge important, okay? <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. So 15 is basically him saying, Paul saying again about how Christ is the head of his body, the church. So yet another verse that talks about Jesus being the head and we are his body. We are the church, okay? We're his body. Now, here's the most important thing we need to read. He says this, verse 16. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, this is where the church not just this church, but all churches, really need to park and think. We need to think about some things. When we come to church, and I'm, I've been guilty of it too, I mean, who, 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 let me ask you a question. Who would want to go to a church that they thought just sucked? Like, the music's terrible, the place is filthy, everyone's mean, you know, they get up and give you a little motivational speech for five minutes. Like, who would, who, nobody wants to go to that, right? 
So, and and I, I agree, I, don't, I wouldn't want to go to that church either. But I want you to see, I want you to see what it says here. He said, he makes, this is God, God, Christ, makes the whole, he, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Okay, so, so in other words, he's put us all here together. He put you here. Now, the end result is healthy, growing, and full of love. That's what we want for a church. But we wouldn't want to go to a church that was horrible. But let me just tell you something. What, what the scriptures is telling us here is that the, the, the reason why it's maybe terrible is because the people who are there, who God placed there, aren't doing what they're supposed to do. See, we go to church because we want it to be good for us. I want to be fed. I want to learn. L listen, we're supposed to learn. The man's supposed to stand up and share a Bible with you. I get it. But here's the thing. You've got to start thinking, about, thinking along the lines of what the Scriptures say. Don't, don't think about what you want. <clears throat> the church could be decent if you've got a decent preacher. But it's never going to be healthy, growing, and full of love until, not, this is personal, until you all do your own special work. See, we, we, none of us, none of us will be, it says that when each person, so if you do your special work, you help her grow, him grow, you grow, you grow. Every, if you do something, if you serve and love and give and pray and participate and engage at your church, if you do that, the people that are all around you, it helps them grow. See, we go to church because we want to grow. And I want to grow too. That's why I study and that's why I listen to preachers and stuff. But when you go to church, when you come here, as each of you do your own special work, it helps the others to grow. See, that makes an awesome church. When you got, when you got a room full of ministers, not just one, when you got a room full of ministers, that's happening. You see what I mean? And so we have to change our perspective. And, and this, is, look, this message is for the people that, of course, that aren't here. Right? And we love them. But when you got to understand something. When, when, when you're here and you're smiling at people and you just like maybe take them to the side and, and you see that there are, there's been times I've seen, you guys have all seen them, you see someone, there's just someone crying, right? You go to church, they're crying, they're hurting. And you just go over and, you just, and you're there and you smile with them and you pray with them and take them by the hand and you comfort them. Man, you've done your own special work and you've helped that person. And so the whole church becomes very healthy and growing and full of love. See, that's the healthy body. When we change our perspective, and it, the Bible talks about esteeming others is more important than ourselves, this is how it's lived out. When you come to church, okay, we are the church, but when you come to the place of the church, you, you have to do your work. You have to engage. You have to make coming a regular thing. You have to, you have to sing. When you, listen, if you're, if you're not, I'm just going to be specific, if you're not like singing you're not helping everybody grow, right? If, if the band got up and they weren't singing, that's certainly not going to help you, right? It wouldn't help if they just stood up there and didn't say anything. Well, listen, if you sing, you help them grow. Amen? When you sing, right, and see what's happened in the church is it's become kind of a one-man show. The people with microphones are the ones who come in and they do stuff, and the other ones just sit and listen. And they, I don't want to be a part of that church. I want to be a part of a church that's engaged. You know what I'm saying? Singing and dancing and giving and serving and loving and praying and hoo -hahing. That's what I want to see. I want to be part of that. So, so see, that's the, that's the healthy body. It says right here. Now, he places us all together perfectly. So it's not like our church is not good. Actually, I just want to, I want to offer you this. I think our church is amazing. I think our church is amazing. And listen, I wish I could be that guy, and, and I'm sorry if I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not saying that because how awesome I think you are. You are awesome. But that's not why I'm saying it. I'm saying it because God's word said he placed us together perfectly. So, so it is awesome, right? Because he doesn't do junk work, does he? God don't make no junk, right? So he put us together, and we're perfect right now. Everything we need to do to be an awesome church that's effective in this world is sitting right here in these seats right now. And, but, but, but listen, he did his part. Preach it, brother. Right. Now we got to do our part. He placed us here. Now listen. 
when people choose to come to this church and they walk into a room and it's filled with all of you guys and you are smiling and happy and welcoming and, uh, and shaking hands and welcoming them to your church. And man, that, that's when it's healthy, growing, and full of love, right? So that's, the, that's, that's, that's what it is. It's a, a, an effective church, the, and this is the only blueprint for a church now. Remember Moses got a blueprint for the, for the tabernacle, how to build it. This is, the, this is the blueprint for the church, for us, right? He said, he said this is the way it's going to be built, and, and it's going to be healthy and growing and full of love. So healthy meaning like in here. We're, we're loving each other. We're serving each other. We're, we're helping each other out. When we have a, a need, we come to each other's rescue. So we're healthy in here. And then it says, and growing. So when it's healthy here... Part of that, the natural outflow from healthy church where we love one another is to go invite other people and say, hey man, you got to come and be a part of this thing. It's awesome here. I love it here. My, my brothers and sisters in Christ, they love me. They help me. They serve me. I serve them. They need me. I need them. It's an awesome family. And I want you to be part of that thing because you don't have that. And I want you to be part of it. And that's what the invitations are for. So it's healthy and it's growing and that's full of love. And they walk in, they should experience the love that Christ has for you and you have for each other. They should be able to, there should be a tangible sense that God has reconciled not only us to him, but to each other. They should sense that when they walk in here, okay? So, let's, uh, let me go back. I can't, my, my, again, my, my notes are a total mess, but please uh, bear with me. Uh, this series, uh, we're going to talk about churches, Okay? And individuals drift, like we talked about last, last week, but in this series, uh, we're going to look at several churches to identify their drift. Because if individuals drift, if you, you can drift, right? And you can drift, and you can drift, and you can drift. But when we get all together, that can make the whole church drift. And so what we're going to do is we're going to study different churches in the Bible. God has sovereignly placed these churches into God's Word so that we could see where they would drift, identify what that drift is, and see, hey, have we drifted there? Or, or we can notice what it is and, and maybe take some preventative medicine from the Scripture so that we don't go there. So we're going to look at at least over, I don't know, seven, eight, nine weeks, we're going to look at at least nine churches in this series, but to launch out uh, briefly tonight, I want to turn your attention to our, our first uh, church, and it's really not a church, it's a group of, it's the churches in Galatia. So if you would, just turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter 1. So we're going to look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, and then we're going to look at Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 5. That's where we're going to kind of camp out for the rest of our time together. So head there in your Bibles. Let's find out what happened here in, in Galatia. I'm going to read these verses with you, and then we'll, we'll chew them a little bit. So in Galatia, it wasn't just a, um, a personal drift. It was a church. This is what it says here. Paul's writing the letter to these people. He plants this church. It's going really well. And he says this in verse uh, 6. He says, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself, through the loving mercy of Christ. You're following a different way that pretends to be the good news, that's the gospel, but it is not the gospel at all. You're being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Okay, so he says that they've changed somehow. They're, they're, they're doing something different now. Let's find out in chapter three what this difference is. He says, uh, verse one of chapter three, says, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you, first of all, no preacher, when he says ask one question, it's never one question, okay? It's a biblical lie, and those are acceptable. I'm just kidding. But this is what happens. He says, let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Well, of course not. You received the, the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? That's another question. <laughs> After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? So the poster child for the drift really is, is these churches in Galatia. Um, just so you know where Galatia is, if we were going to look at a map here, um, let's just say this is a map. 
Can you visualize Israel right here? Can you? It's like a long, tall, skinny. It's a tall, skinny nation over here. And then there's the Mediterranean Sea right next to it. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. And then over here, you'd have Greece and Rome coming down the, the boot, you know, Italy over here. Okay. In that land that connects the two up north of the Mediterranean Sea that connects Israel with, with, the Roman, with Rome and Greece, that was Galatia. That's modern day Turkey. Okay, and so that's what this letter was written to. Uh, there was tons, if you do any study, there was tons of trade, lots of, lots of commerce, uh, lots of, uh, it was an artsy place, uh, high education, high thinking, lots of money trading hands, uh, religious diversity, there was a lot of polytheism going on. You know, they had like many gods. Everyone had different gods for different things, and, and they would pray to these statues and such. Um, highly populated cultural center, extremely busy, heavily, heavily influenced by all these different things, but not heavily influenced by our faith that we have today. And so you may be thinking that the preacher's talking about Galatia, but from what I just described to you, where else could he be talking about? Sounds like America a little bit too, right? Very busy, Melting pot, different religions, di lots of universities, high thinking, science, arts, sports, all these different things that influence our nation and our people, but it also influenced Galatia. And, and here's the, one of the, I love God's word, but one of the things that's beautiful about God's word is that, you know, the name of the city and the, na the name of the nation may change. And, and the time period may be a little bit, you know, this is almost 2,000 years ago now that he's writing this letter. So times may change and the names of nations and cities may change, but the word of God doesn't change. It's, it's good all the time. The scriptures say that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. Even heaven and earth will fade away, but the word of God will last forever. And so let's kind of look at this drift right here and see if we've done it. And let's fix it if we have, and let's prevent it if we haven't using God's word. So let's take a look at their drift. Um, the church is not the building, of course. It's the people. And, and so you, the church, how, how was the church created? How did it start? Well, it's based on love and, and grace and mercy. He extended those things to you. You weren't looking for it in any way, but, but love and grace and mercy were given to you. And so if the church was created because of love and grace and mercy, then therefore the church itself, the place itself, should be a place of grace and mercy and love. But too often, uh, we turn the church into a, a, a performance-based thing. And, 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 and we drift towards rules and regulations and religion. You know, when, when, so, when someone's just the most rotten, nasty person, you, you, we pray for that person. So they'll come to the Lord, right? We do, we pray for them. But heaven forbid they get saved because now they're in your church and you can't stand them. Right? Because they haven't, you know, they came to Christ, but they haven't completely changed yet. So it's like, what the heck's wrong with you? Why are you acting that way? What do you think? I was like shooting up crack in my eyeballs last week. I'm just, that I'm even here is a miracle. You know, but we, we don't give them any grace at all, right? So somehow, some way, we just forgot. And, and uh, I was a total wreck. My sin pile was up to these, up to these tiles on the ceiling, and God forgave me all the, all, all of them, but heaven forbid someone takes your spot in the parking lot. What's wrong with that stinking heathen? What's wrong? We need to pray for him. No, we need to pray for you. We need to pray for you. If there's one thing I want you to get, get tonight, it's this, and, and I, 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 I beg you to look in God's word at this. The, the drift in Galatia was the same as the, the drift in America. And, and, and this is what, you, you need to pay attention to this. This is, this is huge. In Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, I, I, just, I, I hope that you'll just really look there, please. This is, I mean, if you get nothing else. You ready? Ephesians uh, 2, 8 and 9. Y'all got this? Okay. So it's this. You, you got to get this. I'm going to beat this thing on the head till I'm dead. God saved you by his grace when you believed. That's it. You, you were saved by his grace. Like you, you didn't deserve it. You didn't even want it. And, and he saved you. 
Um, read on. He says, he saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. No one. If you've been saved, it was not of your doing. If you've been saved, it's by the grace of God. You didn't want it. You weren't looking for it, but he gave it to you anyway. And so when Paul says in Colossians 2, 6, like just as you accepted Christ, so walk in him, he's talking about this. Like you, you did nothing to get saved. And listen, if you, if you got that one step towards Jesus, that was not of your doing. It was a gift from God, amen? And, and what he's trying to tell us here is that every single step after that is still an act of God's grace. That you cannot take one more step toward God without God giving you the grace and mercy to do so. And so he says that, that just as you came to him, you have to continue to remind yourself of that. Like, I never, I, I didn't, get saved because of anything I did. And so I need to remember that that first step also includes all the rest of the steps that in God's grace and mercy, I'll get closer to him. Step one, step two, step 300, step 500, step 5,000. Any inching towards Jesus is the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you. So, so let me share this truth with you. There's, there's no such thing as going from being a Christian to a good Christian. There's no such thing. There's, there's no such thing as that ever. See, behavior modification doesn't do it. It won't make you a better Christian. If you quit drinking and smoking and all this kind of stuff, crazy stuff, it doesn't make you a, a good Christian. <coughs> you could be an absolute stone-cold pagan, an atheist. You could hate God and stop doing those things and be... And, and, would that make, listen, if I'm, a, if, I, if I'm an atheist and I quit drinking and smoking and doing drugs and chasing women, does that make me a better Christian? No, not at all. That's behavior modification. Listen, I'll, this is how you do it. If you will allow God to seek out internally in you your fears and your doubts and these guilts and wrong thinking and you accept the correction the divine correction of the almighty in in doing that if you allow him to do that frequently allowing him access to your heart and to your thoughts if you will seek that deep and intimate relationship with the living god then he will make you more like christ he won't make you a better Christian. He'll make you Christ-like. As a matter of fact, he, it's not even that. Let's, let's, let's talk about it, what it honestly is. It means that, that you die and there's less of you all the time. So you come to the table, to the Jesus table with who you are, your, your worldview and your perspectives and your priorities, right? And let me tell you something, they're all junk, myself included. They're just bad. And so you come to Jesus at first with all this death and ugly, Right? And he, get, and he starts to break those things away. He starts to wipe those. Hey, man, that's not good for you. That's not good for you. No, you're thinking wrong. No, you shouldn't fear that. No, don't doubt this. Trust me in that. No, treat them better. Don't do that. Get rid of that. Get rid of the guilt. Get rid of the shame. Get, and he starts to work on you. And, and he starts taking out the things that you brought to the table. And he starts filling you up with something totally new. And so you actually begin to die, less of you, and it's actually Jesus Christ living out his resurrected life in your shell. That's what he's really trying to do, okay? So you're not going to become a better Christian, you're just going to become more Jesus and less you. So how does this happen? The, the only way that we can have this happen is by um, two things. It's all that God says and all that God made. That's how we get to know him more. Uh, so all that he says, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. So in a, in a sense, God actually wrote this book. And, and Jesus said that you can search the scriptures day and night and all of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, it points to him. So if you want to get to know God, you read the scriptures because he, he tells us in the scriptures, who he is. If you've done any studying over the years, the entire Bible, it actually is the story of a bunch of different people. 
It's about good nations and bad nations and good kings and bad kings and evil people and good people and men and women and, and how God deals with them and his wrath and his, and his forgiveness and all these different things, all these different nations and people, right? But there's only one steady character through the whole thing. It's not about people. It's about who? It's about God. The Bible is about God. That's the whole, the meta-narrative, the, the entire thing has a bunch of little stories in it, but the overall picture of the Bible is the story of God. That's what the Bible is. And so if you want to get to know him, you have to spend time in God's word. And as a matter of fact, I'm not just making this up, 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us about this word and how to get to know him. In that verse, it says to work hard. Now, does that mean work hard at your job? For sure we should, right? If you don't work, you don't eat. So we should work. But in this context, he's talking about his word. You want to get to know him. He says, work hard. Be a worker unto God. They wouldn't be ashamed who can rightly divide the word of truth, who can really understand who God is by, uh, by spending time. Work hard. That means study hard. Study hard the Bible so you know who he is. And that was the problem with the Galatian church. They didn't. And we need to study hard to know who he is. Be a good worker. Able to divide the word of truth. To understand the Bible. To understand the author of the Bible. God. And that's not, see a lot of us think that that's reserved for the preachers and teachers. The guys who get up like I do and speak. But here's 1 Timothy 2.4. It says that God wants everyone to be saved. Right? Saved. If you're saved, that's awesome. But, he's, but the verse, he goes on, he says, I want him to be saved and to understand the truth. He wants you to understand the truth. And the only way to understand the truth, he said it, is to work hard. You can't just sit by electricity. If I, if I learn a whole lot, or, or let's say Jared studies a whole lot, and I just stand next to him, it doesn't like soak in through osmosis. You have to do it yourself. You've got to pick up the screen. You've got you to let God's word be spoken to you over and over and over again so you can understand who this is. You have to work hard. You have to work hard. So it's all that he says, but then it's all that he made. Do me a favor and go to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. One twenty says this. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. In Psalm 119, I'm sorry, Psalm 19, 1 through 4. says this, sake of time, I'm just going to read it to you. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. You see, so the Bible tells us, we can get to know him by the scriptures. It tells us right there that if we experience, if we see his creation, we're going to know all about God. It's what it says, right? So see, see, we know God by studying his scripture, but we also know God by experiencing what the scripture says. So we can read in the Bible, and this is where I, this is where I want to challenge you. It's a two-step process if you want to get to know God. You've got to read the Bible and see that it says that the heavens proclaim his glory and that they'll speak to you. And that's awesome, right? You know, when was the last time you stood outside and made an effort to go to a dark place at night solely for that purpose? To go and let the heavens speak to you. When was the last time you took time to go out into all that he created so that it, the words of scripture now are being experienced in your life? If you want to know God and, and know his eternal power and his divine nature, you've got to go out and experience that. Let his creation speak to you so you know who he is. So we know him, we know of him in scripture, and we know of him when we live out and experience what the scriptures say. 
You know, when you have a counterfeit money problem, you don't study the counterfeit money. You study the real thing, right? So when the counterfeit money comes across your desk, you can identify it. <clears throat> and so you, you want to study the genuine faith that's in God's word so that you don't drift. Here's our last verse of Ephesians 4, 11 through 14. We're studying the drift of a church that was rocking and they went sideways and ended up in a ditch. Ephesians 4, 11, this is some preventative medicine so that we don't do the same thing. So we can be an effective church of Jesus Christ that reaches people in a dynamic way. Ephesians 4, 11 through 14 Paul is talking about the different uh, offices and the people that fill those offices within a church that Christ gave the church as a gift. He says these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and help build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. You see, that's what, this is what God wants for us. He wants us to, to get to know the Lord by experiencing who He is and studying His Word, working hard at understanding His Word so that we can come to a full, a full knowledge of this God Mature in the Lord is the words he uses. Mature in the Lord. Why, why do we want to become mature in the Lord? Because the next verse says that when we're immature like children, we get tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We, we, that we are influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. And so what this is saying in our modern context is that when someone comes to you and they start preaching something that sounds Christian, you're going to take the bait unless you have studied the authentic. Unless you have immersed yourself in God's word to become very familiar with what it says and who he is, someone can come along like a wolf in sheep's clothing and they can give you poison and you'll start drinking it every time and you will go astray. And that's what he doesn't want for his churches and that's exactly what happened in Galatia. So what was the Galatian drift? The Galatian drift was this, and I pray that it doesn't happen here. The Galatian drift was that they were not rooted in the gospel. The Galatian drift was that they were not rooted, rooted, deep down roots into God's word. They, they didn't know the real faith. And so what happens is it says that, that when, I, when, I, when I came to you, I shared the good news with you and it was as clear, it says it right there in Galatians, it says it was as clear as if you were there yourself on Golgotha, on the, 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 the hill, Calvary, where the cross was. It was almost like you were there. You saw it happen when I told you the good news of Christ. And I gave you not only a, a careful image of what it looked like, but the significance and the meaning and what it accomplished. You had it, it was clear. And then somehow it got fuzzy and you derailed and you drifted off into performance-based religion. See, at first the grace of God was so clear to them, but then it got fuzzy. And so again, in closing, I just want to say this. The most important thing that we can get out of this thing tonight is what I share with you in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and that is that you were saved by grace when you believed and that that first step was a gift from God and let us never forget loved ones that the next step towards God is also because of the grace of God it's because of the grace of God if you're if uh, the, the, the verses that we read there in, in Galatians is this one verse and I kept it out I didn't share it with you until this very end it's in verse 5 of chapter 3. He says, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. 
You see, he says, did he give you the Holy Spirit? See, at, at, when, you're, when you're regenerate, when, 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 when you're born again, it's because his Holy Spirit entered you. So that was the first step. Did, did you get that initial salvation because you kept rules? No. He says, and does God work miracles among you? See, he separates. He said, did, did he save you because you obeyed? And does he work in your lives right now because you obey? No. Every bit of it is the grace of God. That's what we're looking for. That's what, a, if a church can stay there, then a church can be effective in reaching its community. Amen? Amen. The good news the gospel of Jesus Christ that's God's good news it's of who he is and what he did and what he does still today bow with me and let's pray and then we'll be dismissed we're gonna I don't know who brought food or, or what but we're gonna go back there and eat partake in whatever's there and we'll be thankful for it Father, I, uh, I want to thank you uh, for tonight. I want to thank you for each and every person that's here. I want to thank you for my own personal salvation and the salvation of those in my family that I love. I want to thank you for the salvation of everyone in this church whom I love. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to uh, get this down deep into our heart that salvation is by grace alone. By faith only do we receive this salvation. Just in believing, Lord, that you love us and went to the cross to pay for our sin are we saved. It's not by works that we are saved. It is by your grace and your mercy that you've given to us. Remind us often, Lord, that we did not seek your salvation. We did not earn your salvation. We do not deserve it nor can we boast or brag that we've done anything to receive it. Help us also to believe that, that this grace, not only, not only did it give us our first step in receiving the Holy Spirit so that we could become a new creation, but help us to realize that each step that follows, getting closer to you, is also an act of grace from the Holy One. Help us all as a church family to understand that each part of us is absolutely needed here. Give us the reality, like let it not just read it, but help us to sink down into our heart that this church and everyone who's in it right now is, is fit together perfectly. You've done a perfect work as you always do. Help us to realize that each of us is so important in the way we serve attend and give and love and pray and help one another. It's imperative. Your word tells us that you fit us together perfectly and as each of us does our own special work, it helps the others to grow. So change our perspective on gathering and serving, that it's for everyone else. Help us realize that they need me here and I need all of them. desire, Lord, that your church would be healthy, growing, and full of love. Help us to study the authentic and to know who you really are. We thank you. And Lord, now I ask that you would bless the food that we're going to eat. Like your word tells us all good things come from the Father of lights. And so, Father, we thank you for every tasty morsel we're about to love you, Lord. We truly, truly do. We want to serve you and serve you well. Help create some real change in us. Help us to be more like you. In Jesus' good name.